So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. My name is Laura Chetti Galanos. I am the Executive Director of the World Stroke Academy, the educational platform of the World Stroke Organization that provides stroke education to health professionals worldwide. Now, it is with great pleasure that we are hosting this activity today on cervical artery dissection, diagnosis, treatment, and outcome. We have exceptional speakers that will be sharing their expertise on the topic. Before we go ahead and get started, as always, we're going to be sharing some of our housekeeping rules for this webinar. Um, we welcome, of course, any questions that you might have throughout the webinar, but we kindly ask you to use the Q&A box for those in your Zoom control panel so we can look at them in the end during our Q&A discussion. You can, of course, use the chat box to say hi or leave your comments throughout the webinar. Also a reminder that this webinar is recorded and the recording link will be sent out to you via email shortly after the webinar. And it will also be uploaded on the World Stroke Academy site and on our YouTube channel so you can rewatch it. We will be launching two polls during today's webinar. So make sure you participate by voting. These will pop up on your screen so it will be very easy to participate. And lastly, we kindly invite you to fill in the evaluation survey at the end to share your feedback with us and um, some other ideas for webinars. Now, without further ado, let me introduce today's moderator, Dr. Virginia puyol Reis, Vascular Neurology Division Vice Chief at the Flenny Foundation in Buenos Aires, Argentina. Thank you for being here with us today, and the floor is yours. Hello, uh, I would like to welcome everyone to this webinar on cervical artery dissection of the WSO. It's a pleasure to me to present the most distinguished speaker panels in this topic. And please remember that question will be answered at the end so you can write them on the Q&A box during all the presentation. And if we are ready, Dr. Setari Omran from USA will be in charge of opening this uh, session they will present a very interesting talk about diagnosis and diagnostic evaluation of cervical artery dissection. If you are ready, Setari. Um, hi, hi everyone. I'm just sharing my screen right now. Okay, so um, thank you for the introduction. Um, so I will be talking about the diagnosis and diagnostic evaluation of cervical artery dissection. I work at the University of Colorado School of Medicine and I'm a, I'm a stroke neurologist. Um, I'm happy to be here. So I have no relevant financial disclosures. So I want to start off by asking, by um, you know, kind of going over what exactly is a dissection. So a dissection is when you have blood collection and intramural hematoma formation in the arterial wall layers. And when we talk about cervical artery dissection, we most commonly are we're referring to internal carotid artery and vertebral artery dissection, and it most commonly involves the extracranial portions of the ICA or the vertebral artery. Now, dissections can occur spontaneously or as a direct result of significant trauma. Usually, as stroke neurologists, we deal with the spontaneous cervical artery dissections, and we deal with dissections that can occur after minor trauma, but typically the significant trauma, like major car accidents, motor vehicle accidents, we see those being dealt with by vascular surgeons. So most of the time, we're talking about spontaneous cervical artery dissections. And the reason that it's important is because um, nearly a quarter of um, ischemic strokes in young adults are due to cervical artery dissection. So it's a very common ideology of stroke in the young. And so when we talk about the overall incidence of cervical artery dissections, it's, it's low in the general population. It's around 2.623 per 100,000 inhabitants per year. And ICA dissections are more common than vertebral artery dissections. But the instance is probably underestimated with some patients having little to no clinical signs and they may be undiagnosed or misdiagnosed. As we can see from one of these epidemiological studies, around 6% of patients that had cervical artery dissection were actually um, completely asymptomatic. I will also mention that a lot of these epidemiological studies come out of North America or Europe. And so the incidence in other parts of the world is a little less clear. So the pathophysiology of cervical artery dissection is that it results from separation of the arterial wall layers from one another. 
which results in the formation of a false lumen, where then blood enters the false lumen and, um, and, and then the dissection occurs. And really it could be due to separation from an intimal tear um, or direct bleeding from ruptured vase of azorum within the vessel wall. And so it can be either subentimal or subadventitial, depending on which one of these methods occurs. In terms of the location, so ICA dissections are typically a few centimeters above the bifurcation, and they typically involve the distal two thirds of the extracranial ICA near the skull base. For vertebral artery dissections, they're usually within the V2 and V3 segments. So as we're all aware, um, the V2 segment is, goes through the transverse processes of C6 all the way to C2. And then the V3 segment is the extracranial portion that's a little bit more exposed. It's from the transverse process of C2 all the way to the base of the foramen mag, uh, base of the skull at the foramen magnum. And in some patients, you can have multiple simultaneous dissections. So they occur in 13 to 22% of cases. They're more common after a minor trauma, um, after an infection, or in patients that have um, fibromuscular dysplasia or FMD. So why do cervical artery dissections occur? And this is a, a little beyond the scope of this, um, of this presentation, but the leading theory is that's a multifactorial process and that environmental factors serve as potential triggers in patients who have a genetic predisposition to dissections. And so when we talk about environmental factors, we, there's a few that we think about, whether it's recent cervical trauma in the, in the form of um, cervical manipulative therapy or um, you know, uh, some kind of sports-related injury, infection being another common trigger. Um, and then in patients that have genetic predispositions, we typically think about genetic predispositions being an art underlying arteriopathy, whether it's a monogenic disease, such as vascular ehlers danlos syndrome, um, or it's another kind of uh, connected tissue abnormalities or just an arteriopathy. So patients that have dissections can present with local symptoms and signs. The most common ones that we think about being headache and neck pain, um, they occur in the majority of patients that come in with dissections. I think importantly, the headache is very nonspecific. It can range from being a steady pulsating to thunderclap in, um, in, in, symptomatic, in symptoms. And it can also mimic migraine symptoms as well in patients that have a migraine history. In some cases, it can cause isolated orbital pain um, in, case, in rare cases of ICA dissection. And importantly, ICA dissections typically cause um, headache, whereas vertebral dissections typically cause cervical neck pain. And Horner syndrome is another common symptom present in ICA dissections in around 25 to 39% of cases. Other less common, but still um, you know, seen symptoms and signs include cranial nerve palsies. The hypoglossal nerve palsy is the most common one that we see, followed by glossopharyngeal and vagus nerve involvement. And then you can also get cervical nerve root injury um, in vertebral artery dissections. And rarely in around 8% of cases, you can see pulsatile tinnitus due to turbulent blood flow at the dissection site. So now moving on from the, the local symptoms, then we also have um, local signs and symptoms. We also have the ischemic events. So the typical ischemic ones, uh, the, so we typically think about uh, transient ischemic attack or um, ischemic strokes happening um, from dissections. And they typically accompany local signs and symptoms, but in some cases they can even happen um, you know, a few days to a week or two after um, local signs and symptoms start. Rarely vertebrae dissections can also cause spinal cord infarcts. And I believe my colleague, Dr. Yagi, will go more into detail about this, but when, when it comes to how strokes happen in these cases, we typically think about the dissection causing vessel stenosis um, and then resulting in uh, thrombus formation, intraluminal thrombus formation, then causing artery-to-artery -artery distal embolization. But a less common mechanism that can happen is also distal hypoperfusion from a high-grade stenosis or a complete occlusion of a vessel after dissection. Another vascular symptom that can happen in dissection is subarachnoid hemorrhage. It's much less common than ischemic stroke. It's around 1% of cervical artery dissection cases can have subarachnoid hemorrhage. Mostly we think about it in terms of uh, patients that have intracranial extension of cervical artery dissection, um, also in intracranial dissections, but that's a, a separate topic. 
And the reason that this happens is that intracranial arteries are, um, you know, a little different than extracranial arteries. So they lack an external elastic lamina, they have less media and less adventitia, and so they're more prone to aneurysm formation as well as subsequent rupture compared to extracranial arteries. And so that's one thing we need to watch out for when patients have an intracranial extension of their dissection. So the clinical history is key. So in patients that, that have a dissection, they typically, the clinical history they provide you is headache and or neck pain. They may have a Horner syndrome if they have um, an ICA dissection, and then they usually have an ipsilateral ischemic stroke. The stroke symptoms really depend on which artery is involved. It's important to ask about recent mechanical events and personal or family history of connective tissue or vascular diseases. And then on physical exam, um, it's good to check for clinical signs of connective tissue anomalies, such as skeletal, skin, and ocular abnormalities and craniofacial dysmorphisms, which may suggest an underlying, um, uh, cranial, uh, an underlying connective tissue disease. And importantly, in patients that have cervical heart, in patients that are older, so greater than 60 years um, of age, cervical heart dissection may actually be painless with few mechanical triggers. So that's also something to consider in older patients too, although less, like, less uh, likely to be an ideology of stroke. So apart from the clinical symptoms and the history, we need a neuroimaging to confirm the diagnosis of cervical artery dissection. There's a lot of um, neuroimaging findings that we have in dissection. The most common ones that we think about being long tapered arterial stenosis, tapered occlusion, and dissecting aneurysm. But you can also see an intimal flap, a double lumen, or an intramural hematoma in these cases. I tip, we typically think about presence of a long tapered stenosis as being suggestive of dissection when it's located at a common dissection site, so the distal um, extracranial ICA or V2, V3 segment of the vert, especially when it's in the absence of, um, in, of uh, atherosclerosis at that same area or near that area. You can use MRI and MRA to look for dissections. So the use of contrast for MRI can also yield higher quality images. It's not necessary to use contrast, but it helps with the image quality and can better help distinguish uh, and determine if there is a dissection. The typical signs that we think about for dissections on MRI is a crescent sign. So a crescent sign is formed by an eccentric rim of hyperintensity, which corresponds to intramural hematoma, surrounding a hypointense arterial lumen on axial T1. And we typically recommend getting T1-weighted fat sat because it allows for better visualization um, of, the intracranial, of the intramural hematomas. And so just looking at this, um, uh, looking at this MRI, MRA that I have here, you can actually see the crescent sign where I have it with an arrow sign there. Um, and you can actually see it surrounding, in this case, it's actually a little bit of a hyper intense um, intraluminal portion because of slow flow. The other benefits of MRI is that intimal flaps, flaps may be seen on T2 weighted images. And you can also use MRI to determine age of dissection from methemoglobin content and signal intensity on T1 and T2 weighted MRI imaging. So we also can use CTCTA for dissections. Um, it can detect uh, dissection itself, an intimal tear, intramural hematoma, dissecting aneurysms. The common findings on CTA are irregular and asymmetric vessel, narrow lumen, a crescentic hyperdensity um, corresponding to intramural hematoma with thickened vessel wall. Um, as we all know, there are some limitations of CTA, so it's inaccurate contrast bolus timing or strict artifact may limit interpretation. And exposure to radiation and iodinated contrast may not be uh, great for certain populations such as pregnant women. And uh, CT though does compare favor, CTCTA does compare favorably to um, digital subtraction and geography for vertebral or dissection with a sensitivity of 100, specificity of 98 and very good positive predictive and negative predictive values. Um, and it's superior to MRI in identifying pseudoaneurysms, intimal flaps, as well as high grade stenoses. Um, when we talk about which imaging is better for the different arteries, we typically think about CTA being better than MRA for looking at vertebral dissections, but it may be equivalent to MRA when looking for ICA dissections. You can also use carotid ultrasounds to examine for dissections. On a carotid ultrasound, you typically see a double lumen, which, um, which consists of the true and the false lumen um, seen on the B-mode ultrasound imaging. As we all know, there's a lot of limitations to carotid ultrasound. The main ones being that's highly operator dependent, 
depends on your tech um, that you have available at your hospital. There's also low diagnostic utility for detecting dissections near the skull base or within the transverse foramina um, in the for vertebral artery. And it's poor ability to detect ICA dissections with an isolated Horner syndrome. And so if you have a patient who has a normal ultrasound finding, but the clinical history is concerned for a dissection and you have a, a strong clinical suspicion, it's a good idea to still get an MRA or CTA to do a, for confirmation testing. In some cases, though, non-invasive imaging can be negative. Um, and so the ones that we typically think about is that in some patients, Patients who have um, who receive MRA, if they have a dissection involving the horizontal course of the V3 segment of the vertebra artery, um, it may be missed due to orientation of the vessel. Um, the, that horizontal segment, I have it here in red circle. Um, so if you have a dissection there, then that could potentially be missed because it's hard to see the crescent sign on axial imaging um, within that segment. So that's one area that you could potentially miss a dissection on MRA. And neuroimaging may be negative if it's performed long after symptom onset. And the reason for this being that you, you can get early recanalization. And around 16% of patients at one month, they have recanalization and around 50% at three months. And so if a patient comes in with um, more of a chronic stroke or a subacute stroke, you may potentially miss the dissection um, depending on um, when the imaging is done. And so DSA is the other imaging modality that we can use. It's the gold standard for identifying cervical artery dissection. Nowadays, it's rarely used unless the clinical suspicion for dissection remains high, um, mostly because we have great um, non-invasive imaging modalities that we can use instead of using DSA. Uh, so typically in our institution, we mostly use it when a patient isn't thrown back to me. But uh, aside from that, it's not, we don't, it's not our first go-to test, um, uh, testing mechanism. The classic findings on DSA are focal stenosis, so the string sign, the flame-shaped tapering with occlusion, um, which I have here, and pseudolumen and true lumen intimal flap, and um, uh, also looking, you can also see a dissection, dissecting aneurysm as well. And I think with that in mind, I'm done with my section, and I will, um, and thank you for allowing me to give this talk, and I will pass on the back to Virginia. Thank you very much for this interesting presentation, Salehi. Now we move to the second uh, talk. Dr. Shadi Hagi from USA was who proposed this, this topic for the webinar, and we all know him for his interest in cervical dissection, of course, among other stroke uh, issues. He will present a talk about risk of ischemic stroke and recurrent dissection. I'm sure that all uh, in our daily practice discuss this with patients and relatives, so we are going to learn a lot about uh, or with Shaggy from this issue. Please, Shaggy. Thank you so much for the introduction. Thank you so much um, for being with us today. Uh, I'm going to be talking about the risk of ischemic stroke and recurrent dissection and cervical artery dissection. So let's start with the risk of ischemic stroke and cervical artery dissection. I'm going to start with a um, a um, little bit of a challenging case I saw several years ago. This is a 62-year-old man with a history of hypertension. Um, he was taking aspirin uh, when he came in initially. He was admitted for acute onset dizziness, visual changes, and trouble walking. And uh, talking to him more, he reported neck pain for one week prior to symptoms. His history was significant for a left intracranial ICA aneurysm that was clipped several years prior. And uh, on physical exam, he only had a left lower quadrant anopia. He had an MRI and an MRA. Uh, the MRI shows uh, bilateral occipital infarcts. And um, the MRA uh, of the brain shows a dominant uh, right vertebral artery. The left vertebral artery ends in a pica, but really no stenosis in the brain. MRA of the neck was initially read as normal, but looking back uh, at the right vertebral artery, you can see that there's concern for uh, a dissection. Um, at the time, he was continued on aspirin monotherapy. Unfortunately, four days later, he was readmitted uh, because he was um, sleepy, dysarthric, and had right arm numbness. Uh, and he was um, initially went to an outside hospital and was transferred to our institution for further care. On exam, he was sleepy, arouses to voice, speech was dysarthric, 
he had decreased sensation to touch in the right face, arm, and leg. Um, he had an, an MRI that shows uh, multifocal posterior circulation infarcts. And here you can see some artifact from um, his uh, aneurysm uh, clip, uh, but he had um, more um, infarcts in the posterior circulation. Um, he was taken for an angio um, um, to take a look at the dissection, and uh, it, the angio confirmed that he has a right vertebral artery dissection. Um, we also did TCD with HITS monitoring to look for microemboli, and the uh, TCD was positive, so he was actively embolizing. Um, he was uh, started on a heparin drip and uh, subsequently bridged to warfarin. Uh, fortunately, he did well, no further events. But when I saw him in follow-up, he had a moderate cognitive impairment at 180 days. So um, ischemic stroke and cervical artery dissection, a little background here. I know my colleague, Dr. Omran, uh, talked also about this. So cervical artery dissection is not very common among all strokes, only 1% of ischemic strokes, but uh, it's, it's, it's a very common cause of stroke in young patients, 18 to 44 uh, about a quarter, 25% of ischemic strokes and young adults is related to cervical artery dissection. Mind you that the true, true prevalence is a lot higher because, uh, you know, one diagnostic challenges, often we don't see the dissection, especially if it's a vertebral artery dissection, uh, or especially if imaging is done uh, at a later time frame. And, and, you know, sometimes patients don't present with symptoms because they have just minimal symptoms that uh, are self-limited uh, and uh, they don't uh, get evaluated and diagnosed. Um, the risk of ischemic stroke within 90 days after the section diagnosis is about 2 to 3%. Um, and usually these strokes happen within two weeks after diagnosis. Um, 85% of patients diagnosed with dissection, they have ischemic symptoms. And, you know, as my colleague, uh, Dr. Omran said, some of, uh, some of these patients initially have local symptoms. They have neck pain uh, or a Horner, and then a few days later, they develop uh, an ischemic stroke. Uh, this is a really nice study back in uh, 1995 of um, 80 patients with cervical artery dissection. 42 of them had an ischemic stroke, and the vast majority of these strokes happened within the first week. Uh, you know, all the strokes happened within a few minutes to uh, uh, a month from uh, the, the, the section symptoms, but the vast majority happened within a week, even within the first day after the section symptoms. In another nice study, um, um, uh, of 541 patients with dissection with local symptoms or, or a headache or neck pain. Uh, only 2% develop uh, an ischemic stroke. All these strokes happened within four weeks after the section diagnosis. Um, in treat CAD, uh, five out of seven ischemic strokes happened within one day of the section diagnosis. And in, in the CADIS trial, four out of six of the ischemic strokes happened within 90 days of enrollment. Just, you know, all this data suggests that these strokes happen very early within the first week or two after um, the section diagnosis. So why does the stroke happen? Uh, as my colleague mentioned, you know, typically there's an intimal tear and there's rupture of the vasovasorum. There's a hematoma in the vessel wall. And, uh, you know, the intimal tear creates a false lumen where blood can seep into the um, vessel wall uh, causing um, separation of the um, vessel wall layers and uh, leading to a dissection. The dissection could be subintimal, uh, where the hematoma can expand, uh, can expand um, uh, inwards and cause luminal narrowing and potentially disrupt uh, blood flow. It could also be subadventitial and extend uh, outward and uh, cause a pseudoaneurysm. But really, the, the most common uh, cause of stroke is artery-to-artery -artery embolization, where a clot forms on the intimal tear and moves downstream and causes um, a stroke related to artery-to-artery -artery embolization. Um, so the most common mechanism in this study, 85% of patients had strokes related to artery-to-artery -artery embolization, and only 15% had hypoperfusion. Some had mixed hypoperfusion and artery-to-artery -artery embolization, but um, uh, a, a very uncommon cause is the intimal flap occluding the osteum of, the, of a dissected vessel branch that's less than 1%. So who is at risk of stroke? 
the uh, two robust clinical predictors that were consistent across studies um, were male sex and smoking. Other less robust predictors are older age, short onset to arrival time, recent infection. Um, on the other hand, there are imaging predictors uh, that have been studied. The most robust one is having an intraluminal thrombus. You can see this on non-invasive imaging, CT angio, we're doing it more and more for uh, evaluation of patients with an ischemic stroke. And uh, you can see two signs here. This is the donut sign. You can see the hematoma, uh, intraluminal thrombus. Um, and, and this is the finger sign on, on sagittal imaging. Uh, and this uh, portends an increased risk of stroke in the setting of uh, cervical artery dissection. You can also use high resolution MRI because uh, non-invasive um, imaging CT angio or regular MRA um, that can uh, potentially miss very small intraluminal thrombi. High resolution MRI can detect uh, intraluminal thrombi that are associated with a higher risk of uh, ischemic stroke in the setting of uh, cervical artery dissection. Um, others include an irregular surface, intramural hematoma. Mind you, this is different than intraluminal thrombus. Intramural hematoma is a hematoma in the vessel wall. Intraluminal thrombus is in the vessel lumen. Uh, arterial stenosis as well as a predictor of an ischemic stroke, occlusive dissection, multiple dissections, intracranial extension, presence of microemboli on TCD, and uh, vertebral artery involvement. So who is at risk for recurrent cervical artery dissection, and what's that risk? So I'll again start with a case, a 30-year-old woman with uh, a history of hypertension presented with severe unremitting headache for a few days. She reported hypermobile joints, so probably had some sort of connective tissue disorder that's not well-defined. She has a family history of two um, uh, grand grandmothers with aortic aneurysms, and uh, she was also uh, thin. Her BMI was 20. Her neurological exam only showed the left horner, otherwise was unremarkable. She had the CT angio that showed the left ICA dissection. Um, she we also looked for uh, FMD because uh, of her hypertension history and her young age, and her re uh, renovascular arteries were normal. Um, she was treated with aspirin, followed for three months, had, a, uh, had no ischemic events, and had a repeat image here that shows uh, resolution and complete healing of the dissection. Unfortunately, three years later, she came back with recurrent headaches. Her neurological exam was normal. Um, given her history, we did um, brain and, and um, uh, neurovascular imaging, and now she has a right ICA dissection. As you can see, there's an intramural hematoma with uh, occlusion of the right ICA. She had an additional workup this time, given that this is a recurrent dissection. So we did a 14-gene panel looking for a known connective tissue disorder that was negative. She had the CTA of the aorta to look for uh, aortic aneurysms, that was negative. Um, also, we measured her styloid process uh, to look for Eagle syndrome. It was elongated on the left, but not on the right. We also did dynamic imaging and that showed no carotid compression bilaterally. Unfortunately, this time at 180 days, uh, I repeated her MRA and now it shows occlusion uh, of the right ICA and she's getting good flow from the other side. Her perfusion looked okay, but the right ICA dissection this time did not recanalize. So um, risk of recurrent cervical artery um, uh, dissection. So it's about 2 to 9% within the first month and 1 to 2% per year thereafter. It's more likely to happen in a different artery because you know the hypothesis is that the um, prior dissection thickens the artery and that can potentially make it less likely uh, for a, another dissection to happen at the same site. So uh, more likely to involve a different artery. And um, recurrent dissections, especially early on, they're more likely to be clinically minor events, uh, you know, especially that these patients are already on antithrombotic therapy for the first dissection. Uh, so uh, potentially the risk of ischemic stroke is, uh, is lower. Um, this is another patient I saw who uh, initially had the left ICA dissection with partial recanalization. Um, 
came in with a headache and uh, and a um, right uh, cranial nerve 12 palsy uh, and had a right ICA dissection this time. Um, because of her history of hypertension, we looked for FMD. This time we found uh, a lot of renal cysts. We did an MRI uh, of her kidneys that confirmed adult polycystic kidney disease, which is associated with uh, connective tissue abnormalities, dissections, and, uh, and uh, cerebral aneurysms. So um, what are predictors of recurrent dissection? The most uh, prominent predictor is young age. Um, in this study, young age was the only predictor of uh, recurrent dissection. In another study back from 1994, uh, patients uh, under 45 years of age were at risk, at a higher risk of uh, recurrent dissection. Um, uh, also, uh, patients who have a family history of uh, cervical artery dissection are at a higher risk of recurrence, uh, though it's not, uh, it's a very uncommon entity, uh, but does carry a higher risk of recurrent dissection. And most of these are not well-defined connective tissue disorders. They're um, um, nonspecific connective tissue findings. So, um, you know, I always uh, have a talk with my patients, uh, particularly if they're young, and they didn't have any major trauma leading up to the dissection. Uh, I talked to them about precautions to reduce the risk of recurrent dissection. So they should really avoid heavy lifting, contact sports, snowboard, snowboarding, ro roller coasters, um, avoid neck hyperextension, odd neck positions. You know, golfing can uh, has been associated with dissection. Also, uh, you know, long flights, sleeping, and uh, an odd positions, uh, you know, on airplanes can, uh, you know, predispose the uh, increased risk of cervical artery dissection. So as a conclusion, the risk of ischemic stroke with cervical artery dissection is two to 3% at 90 days, but the highest risk is really within the first two weeks from symptoms. Um, factors associated with high, with high risk of uh, uh, ischemic stroke include male sex, smoking, and an intraluminal thrombus. The risk of recurrent cervical artery dissection is higher in the first 30 days, about 2%, but nearly 1% to 2% per year thereafter. Factors associated with recurrent dissection are younger age and a positive family history. Um, we need large multi-center international observational studies to help risk stratify patients with dissection and select them for studies, testing individualized treatment approaches. Finally, I want to um, uh, thank, thank you for your attention. Uh, we're uh, leading the SOPCAT study, comparing dual antiplatelet therapy to oral anticoagulation in patients with cervical artery dissection. I want to thank all the participating sites and thank our team. And uh, we're hoping to get your thoughts on a, on a poll that um, Laura will share uh, in a little bit, uh, leading up to our uh, big debate on uh, uh, antiplatelet therapy versus uh, anticoagulation for cervical artery dissection. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for having me and thank you for your attention. Well, uh, now, thank you first uh, for this interesting talk. And we have the last talk. It's not really a common talk. Uh, it will be more like an engaging debate uh, on the stroke prevention strategy. Again, I think that in our daily practice, we have this debate between anticoagulation and antiplatelet. And today, uh, Professor Stefan Engelter from Switzerland will discuss in favor of anticoagulation. And then Professor Hugh Marcus from England uh, in favor of antiplatelet. So you can start. Please, if you want, you can uh, answer the, the poll. Okay, are, are we ready now for my talk? Yeah, yes, please, Dr. Stefan. Okay, thank you. Can you, see, uh, can you see my slides? Are they in a row, right? Order? Yes, yes. Okay, we can thanks. see them, but we can also see them on the side. So if you want to go on full mode, that will be perfect. Okay, now? Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you for, for you sharing this interesting webinar. 
Now we are coming to the, I think, most important uh, question as physicians, how to treat these patients. And uh, as you know, uh, here is I'm, or we're asked to uh, be, uh, give the talk on pro-anticoagulation. These are my uh, disclosures. And I, as you can see here, I'm always only involved in academic research, non-financial disclosures. But I think the most important disclosure is that I was advocating favoring antiplatelets for more than 15 years. And now I think for good reason, changed my mind based on kind of the science of the tri trials, which I will show uh, you. Okay, cervical artery section. Okay. Now when, Can you hear me? We can hear you and we can see the slide disclosure. Yeah, yeah. But okay, now, now it's working. Yeah. Yes. As we have heard, a cervical artery resection is the major cause of stroke in the young. But this is clear. What is unclear is whether to use antiplatelets or anticoagulation for stroke prevention. And there is a lot of uh, meta analysis seven uh, currently on observational data. And I think you can see here, they came to different conclusions. And I think the most Im important uh, um, uh, conclusion is that the results are not, uh, not conclusive and that it's not, that you cannot uh, uh, define any treatment decision based on these data. But in contrast to the intracranial dissections, we are in cervical artery dissection in the ideal situation that we knew, now have two randomized controlled trials. The first is the UK-based cervical artery dissection in stroke study, the CADIS study, uh, which was primarily designed to show feasibility. And as you can see here, there were numerically only a few more events in the antiplatelet group, but there was no clear difference between antiplatelet and anticoagulation regimen. But it's important to, uh, to notice that the only major hemorrhage, which was a subarachnoid hemorrhage, occurred in a patient with an intracranial extension of the VA dissection, which we heard is a kind of different to, to the, those which are restricted to the extra, extracranial part. There's a lot of things to learn apart from this, the meaning of uh, extracranial uh, intracranial extension from CADIS. That means that the RCT based on purely clinical endpoint seems not to be feasible. As you can see here, we would need so many sites and for so many years to study this sufficiently. The next point is that diagnosis dissection is obviously challenging in the, in the acute phase, as in one out of five CADIS patients, the diagnosis of cervical artery dissection was not confirmed in central imaging reading. As we think, this is an important uh, topic and we should, should know, should know um, how to treat these patients. We thought maybe a trial would be feasible uh, with imaging uh, outcomes in addition to clinical outcomes. The role model for this approach was the carotid stenting versus surgery trial, where there was an MRI substudy and they came to similar virtually identical results with less than 10% of the patients. Therefore, we designed the aspirin versus anticoagulation in cervical artery dissection trial, the tree trial, tri an open label randomized non inferiority trial. Why is this a non inferiority trial with blinded assessment of endpoints? Because we assume that if shown non-inferior aspirin, which is cheap, safe, and convenient to use, will become the default treatment. We, uh, knowing that it's challenging to uh, verify the dissection acutely, we focused simply on patients with symptomatic cervical eye dissection with verification by magnetic resonance imaging means. And we used as an intervention 300 milligrams per day or VKA with IV heparin or low molecular weight heparin recommended until the target EMR is reached. 
closed for 90 days. The primary endpoint as 400 hours was a composite of clinical and MR outcomes. Here, the MR outcomes in particular for within the 41st two weeks with the focus on new ischemic or hemorrhagic brain lesions in the per protocol populations, taking into account that it could be really challenging to pick the right patients. We had nearly 200 patients enrolled and randomized. And as you can see in the last line, there were 91 included in the per protocol analysis of the aspirin group versus 82 included in the per protocol analysis of the VKA group. And as you can see here, this is a, a classical cohort of population of uh, cervical line resection patients, which were in their mid 40s. We have a male preponderance, a small male preponderance, about 60% of those. The carotid was more often involved in the vertebral. Multiple uh, dissections were, uh, uh, were uh, present in 9%, and cerebral ischemic events occurred was the primary um, uh, presenting symptom in about 50% uh, of the patients. Here's the primary endpoint, and it was a surprise, at least for our team, that we had in 23% of the aspirin group, we had primary endpoints, uh, while only in 14.6% of the VKA patients outcomes occurred. That means there was an absolute difference of more than 8%, the p-value for non-inferiority was 0.55, meaning that we missed our uh, goal to show non-inferiority. As non-inferiority trials are difficult to, to understand, this is a graphical sign to show here. And as you can see here, zero low in, in, indicates where there is a preponderance on the left side would indicate favor in aspirin, on the right side favor in VKA. And the blue dotted line shows where the non-inferiority margin, a large, a rather large margin was situated. And as you can see, the confidence interval crosses the non-inferiority margin, showing that aspirin is not non-inferior. It also crosses the zero line, indicating that at least here in this sample size, VKA was not superior. This is not an easy, understandable situation, but it's indicating that it's non, not inferior, but also the BKA was not superior. Looking at the sensitivity analysis, they show a pretty robust uh, uh, picture, indicating that the dots are always on the right side of the zero, indicating that there might be a, a scope for benefit uh, of those patients treated with BKA. In particular, if you look at the clinical outcomes only, we hardly miss the clinical significance. Looking the in the results in more detail, aspirin was not shown non-inferior. The evidence to consider aspirin as the standard of care is therefore weak. Instead, the argument for the traditional treatment and equalization is now reinforced. Also, as I pointed out, the superiority of anticoagulation is still unproved. Looking in the results in more detail, all ischemic strokes occurred in the aspirin of 300 milligram group, all seven. And like for the ischemic strokes as clinical outcome, numerically more 11 versus seven of the subclinical ischemic MR lesions occurred in the aspirin group. And the only major hemorrhage occurred in the VKA group, but this was a GI blood, not an intracranial blood. Neither deaths nor intracranial bleds occurred. Interestingly enough, five of the seven ischemic strokes in the rest group, uh, green group did occur on day one, indicating the importance of early treatment. And 32 of 33 patients, that means virtually all with primary endpoints, presented with stroke TIA, MRI lesions, or both already at baseline, indicating the characteristics of the most a value, a valuable um, patient group. If we do a brief meta-analysis of the three-month outcomes of the CADIS and the TRICAP trial, you can see there is definitely no clear picture of a, in, regarding of a significance. But as you can see, the diamond is on the left side, indicating uh, some 
a benefit of anticoagulation, albeit not significant. If we just look at ischemic stroke as the most important, most feared endpoint and most frequent endpoint in particular, you can see that we just missed statistically significant with a p-value of 0.06. And if we lo look at the longest available follow-up for both trials, that means CADIS long-term at one year and treatment at three months outcome, we now here have a statistically significant difference in favor of anticoagulation uh, in compared to, uh, to antiplatelets for this outcome. That means there are arguments favoring anticoagulation in, in uh, cervical artery dissection. Aspirin numerically have more events than with VKA, almost twofold in the treatment trial. And all ischemic strokes occurred in the aspirin group, and the only outcome of the VKA group was in GI black. And it's questionable if this is as important as an, uh, as an ischemic stroke. If we look at CADIS, pre-cut all the meta-analysis, all the point estimate consistently favors anticoagulation, although it's not a statistically significant difference. This was consistent across study populations, subgroups, and imaging findings. And there was one intercranial blood in more than 200 anticoagulated patients combining treatment and CADIS. And this was in a patient with intracranial extension of the virtual artery dissection, indicating this is that this is the situation where you should rethink yourself. Ischemic stroke as outcome much, is much more common than major hemorrhage. In the meta-analysis, the ratio was 11 to, compared to two. And the meta-analysis was the longest follow-up, the ischemic stroke, in, with regard of the outcome ischemic stroke, antiovalence were significantly better as aspirin. What about direct oral anticoagulants? Neither in TreeCut nor in CADIS anticoagulation uh, novel or uh, non direct oral anticoagulants were tested. They were not allowed for, um, for uh, technical reasons and for allowance by the ethical committees. But, and there are some observational data. But altogether, there were just more than 50 patients in which were reported on with the treatment of uh, and with NOAX in these patients. And the ischemic and hemorrhagic risk profile was similar to antiplatelets or between K antagonists. However, the safety in these cervical artery dissections with these agents were unproven. And uh, in most countries, at least, there's no approval for cervical artery resection for this kind of treatment. There is pretty new data on, uh, on these uh, substances. There is a systematic review and meta-analysis that just published at the end of last year. And as you can see here, a total of only 53 patients were reported, and there were in hardly any direct comparison, com uh, comparisons between uh, NOACs and VKAs. Here is the un indirect comparisons looking for the outcome stroke or TIA. And as you can see here, there were hardly any uh, difference in the outcome rates of 4.9% for stroke or TIA for VTA and 4.3% for the NOACs. But be aware, this is observational data. What about the bleedings? If we look at the minor bleedings in the upper part of this slide, you can see that there were even more bleedings, minor bleedings in the NOAC than in the VTA group here. But if you look at the major bleedings, there were, clear, uh, more, there were clearly more bleedings in the VTA group with, than in the NOACs. However, again, this is observational data with very small numbers. I came to the conclusion after balancing, balancing risk and benefits, anticoagulation is preferred, in particular in dissection patients presenting with ischemia and in those without intercranial extension of the dissection. And direct organ anticoagulants, this is um, and, and war, should be worse to be tested, but it's not prime time to be used now. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for having me and saving, thank you for joining in. And I'm happy to entertain any questions later on. Thank you.
Professor Hugh Marcus, if you want, you can start. Thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? Yes, perfect. Great, yes. great. Thank you so much. I'd like to suggest to you that antiplatelets are equally good, but not necessarily better than anticoagulants, but they're easier to give. So I've got um, no disclosures really that are relevant, except that I was PI, co-PI of the CADIS trial. So we've been over the mechanisms in carotid and vertebral dissection, and we've heard very nicely about how one gets um, the, the um, thrombus in the vessel wall or the hemorrhage in the vessel wall, which can lead to both vessel occlusion and hemodynamic compromise, but also can lead to embolism from, from blood clot, which occurs at the site of the tear. And we've heard that the predominant mechanism that seems to cause stroke in these patients is embolization rather than hemodynamic compromise. And this is for a number of um, lines of evidence support this. Firstly, the pattern of infox, as you can see there, they look typical embolic wedge-shaped infox. Secondly, one can get stroke even if there's no tight stenosis or occlusion. So just from a flap, one can get stenosis, one can get stroke, showing that it doesn't depend just on hemodynamic compromise. And thirdly, as we've heard, you can use transcranial Doppler to detect circulating embolic signals. So we know the predominant problem in these patients is thromboembolism. So it makes sense to try and give something to prevent thromboembolism. And our two options are anticoagulants and antiplatelets. So should we give anticoagulants? Well, people have suggested anticoagulants might be better because you've got thrombus there and maybe they're better at treating thrombus. Um, but they could also include, in, increase bleeding into the vessel wall, which could increase the chance of getting vessel occlusion. And they could increase bleeding into the brain infarct in larger strokes as well, which could lead to hemorrhagic transformation. Perhaps antiplatelets could be less effective um, pathophysiologically, but we should be cautious in saying this because I remember many years ago where we used to treat all of our carotid stenoses with intravenous heparin. And now we know that actually dual antiplatelet therapy is much more effective. But antiplatelets also might have less um, bleeding risk, both into the vessel wall and causing hemorrhagic transformation. So you can argue that both may be better. So we, if we're going to work out which to give, we need to look at the evidence. So I'd like to review the evidence, and I'm going to review three lines of evidence. I'm going to review observational data, randomized controlled trials, and surrogate markers. So let's start with the observational data. So this is a lot of this data. It's very important to remember it's not, you know, it's got a lot of potential bias. These were usually non-controlled, often retrospective studies. Um, there may be publication bias, but nevertheless, it's worth looking at it. And if you look at this very large number of studies published in the meta-analysis in 2012, um, from a large, you know, fairly large number of patients, over a thousand on anticoagulants, 500 on antiplatelets, you can see that the arrow is directly in the middle, so no evidence of any difference between antiplatelets and anticoagulants. Now, this was a little old, but if we look at a much more recent, very rigorous um, meta-analysis carried out as part of the European Stroke Organization guidelines, a um, little bit more selective in the studies, so there's less data there, but you can see again um, there's absolutely no difference between the two treatments. The, the diamond is almost on the unity line. So the observational data suggests that there's no difference between these two treatments. But as I mentioned, there are some limitations to that data. What about the randomized controlled trial data? Well, there have been two trials. The first and larger trial was CADIS. And this was a trial originally um, um, thought up by John Norris, and who, I was co-PI with him. So this was a pragmatic trial to work out whether antiplatelet agents or anticoagulants were more effective when given within a week of the onset of symptoms. And randomization was between heparin followed by warfarin or antiplatelet agents. Now the choice of antiplatelet agents was up to the clinician, but in practice the most common was aspirin followed by clopidogrel 
very few patients had dual antiplatelet therapy. There was open treatment, but blinded adjudication of endpoints. Trial treatment continued until three months um, and follow up then, at which time there was a repeat MRI and CTA in those centers that agreed to do that. And there was a continued follow up to 12 months, but treatment between three and 12 months was at the choice of the physician. So the first striking thing when we looked at this was how low the recurrent rate was, quite a lot lower than the study, for example, from BIOS that so we heard in the first um, talk, or sec sorry, second talk. You can see at three months, we only had a 1.6% recurrent stroke rate. At 20, 12 months, only 2.4%. So this was quite a surprise, but suggests that strokes are not quite as common as we thought, at least by the time patients present to hospital. If we look at the stroke rate per, by type of patient, it's interesting that the rate in patients who present with stroke and TI is about 3%. But in those patients who presented with local symptoms, such as pain or horners, there were no strokes at all. So this may be relevant clinically. So because there were um, very few strokes, obviously it was very difficult to show a difference between the two arms. And you can see that our primary endpoint of stroke, death, or major bleeding was present in at three months in three in the um, platelet arm and two in the anticoagulant arm. So there's absolutely no difference, a p-value of one. I'd just like to point out that at 90 days, uh, sorry, 12 months, it was four and three. There was, in fact, a further ischemic stroke between three and 12 months in the anticoagulant group, which is differs from the um, meta-analysis that was presented in the last talk. So absolutely no evidence of any difference, but lower risk than we had thought. So then we move on to TREAT CAD trial, which we've heard about very nicely, another nice study, um, but again a phase two trial. But as in any clinical trial, we've got to be really careful we don't overinterpret the results. We've been shown this is a mistake in many, many studies in the past. So we have to look at the primary endpoint. And as we've heard, the primary endpoint um, was not significantly different between the two groups. Um, this is a quote from the paper itself, um, p-value 0.55. So it showed no evidence that aspirin was inferior to anticoagulants. What did the authors conclude? Well, they concluded our findings did not show that aspirin was non-inferior to vitamin K antagonists in the treatment of psychological dissection. Now, I had some limitations, and one of them is that it didn't use dual antiplatelets. So we don't know what the result would have been if dual antiplatelets had been used, and maybe platelets would have been better than anticoagulants. So that's the randomized controlled trials. Now let's look at the third line of evidence, which is surrogate endpoints. And we know that quite a few of the dissections we can analyze, about 60%. This is a study from a few years ago. So what about anticoagulants versus antiplatelet agents on recanalization rates? And we've heard this is a predictor of recurrent stroke. Well, we found in CADIS almost exactly the rates that were reported in that previous study. So you can see that about 60% or 61% in the antiplatelets can't be canalized and about 59 and a half in the anticoagulants. So no difference at all between the two. So no evidence that one or other is better at recanalizing. The second um, surrogate endpoint we can use is a pseudoaneurysm. So here you can see these, these outpouchings from the vessel wall, which look quite horrific when you see them sometimes. And here's a beautiful 3D CT that's been lent to me by um, Chris Levi from Newcastle, Australia. So these are worrying when you see them. What about in, in um, Cadiz? Well, what was interesting about these actually were how dynamic they were. So they occurred in 24 of 264 patients. This is from the Cadiz randomized and non-randomized arm. So about 10%. When we followed up at three months, we found that 50% of these had disappeared but 24 new ones had developed over the first three months. So very dynamic, which was an interesting finding. But let's concentrate on what we're talking about. For this debate, were antiplatelet agents or anticoagulants better at preventing these occurring? And the answer is no. There was no significant difference between the two. So whether you took antiplatelets or anticoagulants didn't affect 
whether the dissecting aneurysms there originally persisted or whether you got new dissecting aneurysms. So surrogate endpoints show no difference. So that's where we are. And so the data we've got really shows no convincing difference. One is better than the other. But let's ask a group of experts what they think. And we're very fortunate that there's been a very rigorous ESO guidelines for management of dissection led by Stephanie DeBet. And this was published um, online 2021, and I think um, in the journal in 2022. So we've already heard about the observational studies, meta-analysis they did, which showed no difference between the two treatments. We've heard about the meta-analysis of RCT data, which showed no significant difference between the two treatments. So what did the um, experts um, conclude? So the experts said that in the acute phase of symptomatic extracranial artery dissection, we recommend clinicians can prescribe either anticoagulants or antiplatelet therapy. Quality of evidence was moderate. So that's the experts view. And just lastly, let's not forget antiplatelets are much simpler and can be much cheaper. So they're easier to give. And often, if somebody's just got a very minor event, they allow rapid discharge. You don't have to bring the patient in for heparin. Because if you're going to give anticoagulants, you have to give heparin and then warfarin. We've heard about DOACs, and these may well be the, you know, one of the treatments in the future, but we don't have RCT evidence. At the moment, they work, and they're not licensed to give. And let's also not forget the benefits of antiplatelets may have been underestimated, because in CADIS, most patients had single agents, and in TREAT, they all had single agents. But we know that for carotid disease, dual antiplatelets are much more effective. So, for example, in CARES, Many years ago, we showed that aspirin and clopidogrel was much more effective at preventing embolization in acute atherosclerotic plaque. And in chance and point, it's been shown that they're more effective at preventing um, recurrent stroke after TIA and minor stroke. So I would say that antiplatelets, based on the evidence we've got, are as effective, they're cheaper, they're easier to use, and importantly, they're preferred by patients. So what do I do now? Well, I give aspirin and clopidogrel, and then after about a month, I give clopidogrel alone, um, based on, on the evidence as best as I can put it together. And I'm very happy, um, I'll stop there, and very happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much for this presentation. Uh, you can read on the chat the result of the first poll. Uh, I think the majority uh, decide uh, for dual antiplatelet or sample antiplatelet. And now we are going to pull again uh, the to launch again the poll. Please, you can choose for your option. Well, if we can see, oh, we are going to, to discuss about these results. Uh, but uh, again, the majority decide for dual antiplatelet therapy. Well, if we are ready, we can start uh, with the question session. Uh, we have a lot of interesting questions. Uh, Perhaps to, to resume some question in, in one, there is a few questions about uh, pseudoaneurysms, uh, how long we can uh, we have to, to look after uh, the, the dissections of aneurysms and how uh, we must treat it. I, I, I can know. take this question. <laughs> um, that's a great question. Um, it's not very frequent pseudoaneurysms. Typically, you know, in my practice, I see them at the time of diagnosis. If they're extracranial, the risk is very low. I just monitor them, um, uh, follow them up with um, uh, uh, imaging, uh, Doppler, um, uh, MRA, CTA. Um, some of them regress, some of them stay there. Uh, if they're not causing any symptoms, I would just follow them. Intracranial uh, pseudoaneurysms are more dangerous. Uh, 
if, if there's symptomatic causing pseudoaneurysm, I would say, uh, you know, they should be treated um, emergently. Um, if they are not causing symptoms, I would also favor treatment or just very close monitoring. Uh, but, you know, luckily they're not encountered often. And if they're extracranial, they don't cause much symptoms. Perfect. And another very interesting question from Gustavo Zaposnik, perhaps Dr. Stefan uh, could respond, in uh, about anticoagulation for extracranial dissection. By time from symptom onset, if for uh, you the same to initiate the day two, the day four, the day 10 from the initiation of symptoms, or do you change uh, the indication? I, I use them, I use uh, anticoagulation right from the beginning, knowing that that the very first days, as we all heard several times today, is are the most uh, um, vulnerable days. Therefore, I start really pretty early and I usually stop uh, anticoagulation at about uh, at the latest of three months, maybe if there the is healing of the artery earlier, even after a month, knowing that this is not evidence based, but the, the the expertise show that this is a reasonable approach. And then we usually switch to aspirin for a year. And then as, as Shadi mentioned, we look for uh, dissecting aneurysm. And, and if there is nothing there at all, we, we stop the anticoagulation. But this is another, another issue. How long should we uh, do the, uh, the antithrombotic treatment at all? Thank you. There's a uh, few questions about uh, choosing the, the strategy uh, between if you have a risk uh, from recurrent stroke or recurrent dissection, like floating thrombos. Uh, do you use this uh, risk for uh, ischemic stroke to choose between antiplatelet or anticoagulation? Okay. I don't know if I, I, don't know. If I should take this question. I definitely use. I. As I pointed out, I used the, the high risk group, which we consider the high risk group for ischemic stroke. We use uh, heparin followed by a VKA for those presenting with ischemia and in particular if they present with, uh, with an intraluminal thrombus, but this is rare, to, to be honest, this is really rare. I don't know if I remembered, I think the last, I think it's more than five years that I encountered the last one with an intraluminal thrombus. As Shadi pointed out, there is an important difference in between intraluminal thrombus and intramural hematoma. Most of the patients have intramural hematoma, but just a tiny minority has an intraluminal uh, thrombus. If they have that, I definitely you would use uh, a heparin. I think a humor markers will probably do the same if there is an intraluminal thrombus. Thanks. Um uh, when you decide for antiplatelet therapy for extracranial dissection, uh, do you in favor for one antiplatelet over another, or when you do you recommend dual antiplatelet? I have uh, Hugh can respond. This. Yeah, maybe I. I mean, I I actually now would give dual antiplatelets immediately. Um, I mean, I completely agree with Stefan. Whatever treatment you give, you have to give straight away. So if you're going to give anticoagulants, you've got to start it immediately. If you're going to give antiplatelets immediately. So if I give antiplatelets, I would load with 300 of clopidogrel, 300 of aspirin. Um, in the same way as, you know, just giving exactly the same as you would give in the point or char um, chance trials um, as, as soon as possible. Because I, I think the, the other thing that has come out of the data is that, you know, people, if they are going to have recurrent events, they often occur very early. And in fact, I think one of the reasons why the papers like the BIOS paper, which gave such a high rate, is that quite often you have people who come and say, I had a very minor event. And then half an hour later, I had a major stroke. So I think there are those people who are just having these very, very minor events. And then immediately after, those are almost impossible to prevent, obviously, because they, you know, they're happening before they come to hospital, but this early period is really re is really the urgent period. So I would get in there as quick as I can, and that's been a bit of a Thank you. And another very interesting question: How long uh, do you continue the treatment? Three months, six months? Uh, do you change uh, antiplatelet to anticoagulation or anticoagulation to antiplatelet in some moment of treatment? But from the antiplatelet point of view, I would I would give. Um, about a month of um, 
dual antiplatelets, and then I would give up or, or up to three months. But the recent data from the meta-analysis from Charge and Point suggested maybe you know three weeks is enough. Then I would move on to um, clopidogrel alone, and I tend to image people. This is non evidence based, but I tend to repeat a CTA or an MRA at about three months and see if there's a healing. And if there is complete healing, I often would actually just stop antiplatelets after about a year or so. If there isn't complete healing, if there's a stenosis there, then I tend to continue with antiplatelets just with a single antiplatelet. But this isn't really evidence based. I don't think we've got good data as to how long to continue. And it's a sort of discussion you need with the patient as well, I think. What do they want to do? Thank you. I, I think Stefan is probably similar to that, weren't you, Stefan, in what you were saying earlier? Yes, yeah, I think that that's exactly the point. If the patients were, were, uh, present with ischemia and will start with anticoagulation, will continue for at least a month, usually for three months, then switch to aspirin, do another uh, imaging at three months, and, the, and another one at one year. And if there's completely healing, completely, healing, that means no stenosis, no dissecting aneurysm, then we stop uh, even the antiplatelets. And as Hugh pointed out, uh, there is no uh, no evidence, uh, uh, no, no randomized controlled trial evidence, but uh, we encountered hardly any problems with it, this approach. We do not see any, any events later on until now. Thank you. And Shadi, how long do you recommend avoid risk situation like sports or something like that? Um, regarding the high risk activities, uh, or or any coagulant or anti No, no, high-risk oh, yeah, activities, yes. Oh, uh, uh, high-risk activities. Um, I would say definitely until the dissection heals. And then, um, you know, if they are high-risk, if they have connective tissue abnormalities, if they have um, recurrent dissections, I'd say lifelong. Um, you know, it's hard to avoid these lifelong, you know, especially in young people. But, you know, those at high risk, I would say lifelong. If they're not high risk, definitely at least until the dissection heals. The first 90 to 180 days. Thank you. And for Satori, uh, when uh, do you uh, do a control imaging after the dissection? So I usually do repeat imaging around three to six months after the dissection, just to see if there's any revascularization um, or degree of recanalization, um, and if there's any improvement in the vessel. I don't think there's a lot of data to do it past that point if there's no recanalization or minimal recanalization. Um, but I usually do it around the three to six months. Now, I've had a couple of cases where I felt like there was a cavernous involvement of the dissection, so it started to go a little bit more towards the intracranial portion. And at that point I've done sooner imaging like a week or two afterwards. There's not great data on that, but that was just to see if there's any intracranial um, pseudoaneurysm formation. So that was the, those are the cases I may do imaging sooner than um, the three to six month time. Thank you. And another question, uh, what do we do with statins? Do you use statins? How long? Um, I can answer. Um, I typically use statins for at least the first 90 days. You know, this is not evidence-based. Again, this is my practice. Um, if the patient has high cholesterol, I'd continue them on a statin. Um, but for all comers, I'd try to use moderate or high-intensity statin therapy for at least 90 days, just more for the pleiotropic, pleiotropic effects of statins. Um, Long-term, uh, I think if their LDL is low, I would try to take them off the statin. I don't know what others do, but this is my practice. Yes, I I, I do the same. <laughs> well, I'm, uh, sorry, sorry. I'm more reluctant to use the, stat the statins, knowing that the the incident, the frequency of uh, hypercholesterolemia is lower than the normal population. Then we think it's in particular, if the LDL cholesterol levels are, are even on the lower side, then I'm kind of reluctant. I understand your point, and if the levels are high, of course, we'll, we'll get them, but for another indication, that's kind of primary uh, prevention of atherosclerosis rather than uh, not related to dissection. But I think this is a, one of the 
really unknown fields at all in, in dissection medicine. How is there any any need, any necessity for for the for the statins? Good question. Yes, and for other panel, uh, what is your experience with acute treatment with the perfusion treatment in dissection, and what is the indication of stenting in dissection? I can start off for acute treatment when it comes to thrombolysis. I offer it. Um, you know, I don't think there's any clear reason not to offer thrombolysis in these patients. Uh, whether you use altiplase or tenecteplase. Um, I, I would offer it. I think the only cases I would be a little bit, uh, you know, just a little bit more concerned about would be if there's intracranial extension of the extracranial cervical artery dissection. Um, in those cases, I may just tell the patients, pose the question or pose the risk as being a little bit higher than the 6% because there may be an associated risk of subarachnoid hemorrhage that's higher than the 6%. When it comes to doing endovascular treatment, I also think that there's pretty good data to support doing endovascular treatment in these cases. Um, what we're trying to figure out more though is in terms of what's the best me method to do it, what, you know, how to treat these tandem occlusions, if you should also stent the artery, the, um, the disease dis dissected artery at the same time or not. And there's some good data to also, uh, there's some data to support also doing stenting in these cases um, acutely. So. Uh, I don't know if that answers the question, but um, that, that's how I would, I would I would offer all our acute treatment that I would offer in another patient. I think I do agree that it, there's no reason to withhold this kind of treatment in, in dissection patients. But I think what is always uh, kind of worrisome that the results are not as good as we could expect for those younger ones. And therefore I think we have not really understand as of yet why this is the case. I think the, 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 the results are kind of sobering and not, not as good as you would expect, in particular for endovascular treatment. And we have not figured out why. But that's not a reason to withhold this kind of treatment. Maybe um, a, it's, as, as you mentioned, uh, I think it is clear that we might not have the right technique for these patients. Maybe I mean, we have to, have a different approach at least. I agree as well. Um, you know, my practice is to uh, treat them with thrombolysis or uh, mechanical thrombectomy. Um, you know, uh, uh, only the patients who have intracranial dissection or intracranial extension, I'd be worried about thrombolysis. Uh, but otherwise, if they're eligible for thrombolysis uh, or mechanical thrombectomy, uh, there's no reason not to. Um, try to administer this acute treatment. Um, stenting, again, you know, there's some data showing that it's safe, um, uh, but, you know, we need more data on that acutely. Chronic stenting, I would try to avoid it, you know, unless someone, um, uh, you know, is an extreme case where they have recurrent um, ischemic events despite anti-maximal medical treatment. I'd, you know, um, use dual antiplatelet initially, anticoagulation. If they keep failing uh, antithrombotic treatment, then I would consider um, stenting. The other alternative is uh, vessel sacrifice. You know, if it's a non-dominant vertebral artery and there's good flow from the other side, I would consider, you know, sacrificing the artery. Uh, but these are extreme cases, you know, I think as, uh, you know, uh, all the data we presented uh, today, uh, most of these patients do well with antithrombotic treatment. And just a, an important point to make is that, you know, I completely agree with what you've all said about thrombectomy, but it, stenting in the absence of doing a thrombectomy acutely is not really indicated, which it, it has been done in the past by some people, but... Um, you know, because so many of these cases will recanalize on their own. So if you don't, if you're not doing a thrombectomy, and, but you have a stenosis, acute stenting is, is, I don't think is indicated. Okay. Um, Dr. Gustavo Saponis asked that uh, when you diagnose the patient later, later than one week uh, from symptoms onset, would you still initiate anticoagulation more than a week from symptoms onset? This is this is a good Stephane. question. Yeah, sorry. This is a good question. Um, it's, yeah, 
knowing that time course, I would uh, think it's probably not uh, not so more important that you that you use it. But may, what if you had asked for two weeks? I would say definitely no. But after one week, I probably will say just do it for a week. I think the risk is probably rather low, and, and particularly at our cafe, if you are sure there's, that there is no uh, interruption and extension of the IRT. That makes the difference. If you see, for me, it's a high risk of patients for ischemia. But I think that uh, the time, the risk is time dependent, that we are in the declining phase of this risk. On the other hand, the risk for, for bleeding, in particular intracranial bleeding, is low as long as there is no uh, intracranial extension. Therefore, I think it's balancing risk. And I will discuss, would this, discuss with the patient, maybe discuss that for, for two weeks anticoagulation, then switch to aspirin. But that's, that's a tough question. Another interesting question, uh, when you have intramural thrombus, uh, are the patient have symptoms of new ischemic stroke uh, being uh, on antiplatelet treatment? What is the next step? Anticoagulation, perhaps stenting? I, th I think if people have recurrent symptoms on either treatment, I would probably switch to the other treatment. Yeah. But I, I don't think I would necessarily stent unless... Um, I mean, you do get very, very occasional patients who have very tight stenoses and you can show on, you know, CT perfusion or whatever that they've got really critical stenosis. And, you know, we have a very occasionally stented these patients, I would say less than one a year. Um, but I think if you're going to, you know, if, if you're going to consider any interventional treatment, you've really got to show the hemodynamic compromise is present, not just a stenosis, but the consequences on the brain of the stenosis are very poor it, because you've got poor collateral supply. But, but normally, if, to answer to your question, I'd just switch to the other treatment. I don't know what others would do. Yeah. Eddie, what would you do? Uh, yeah. Or Stefan? Yeah, I would do the same, yeah. Switch mm -hmm. and escalate. But I, I think the standing or emergency standing would be kind of the last mm -hmm. uh, the last uh, modality to you to be used, and and as you pointed out, I think there has to be a um, a really a dangerous uh, perfusion uh, perfusional situation. This would be the indication, just as a last resort. Okay, another very interesting question is uh, how do you extrapolate the result of trials to use the uh, direct anticoagulant? And when do you decide to use direct anticoagulant? Uh, for me, the answer is pretty clear. We are not allowed to do that in our country. Uh, therefore, we have no license for that. Uh, we have no reimbursement for this kind of treatment. Therefore, I'm really reluctant, but we would be really interested to study this further. And therefore, we have kind of uh, the, the stop. Uh, the idea uh, uh, collaboration is a good way to, to know at least for the observational uh, kind of observational evidence, uh, whether this would make sense, and then have a trial to do that. I think just to, I think this is probably the future to test is uh, duals versus uh, dual antiplatelets versus uh, the works. I think this this would make sense uh, to be tested. But currently, it's not for me. It's not prime time to just use it. But that's a personal opinion. Yeah, I think it's I think it's difficult. I mean, I suspect it's as it's it's as good as anticoagulants. I think many of us do, but it is a little tricky using it. But um, Chaddy, you're doing this trial at the moment, aren't you? Can you tell us where where that trial's got to? It's very exciting. Yeah, it's an observational real world study. Oh, um, okay. So patients are not randomized, but just given um, the um, uh, differences in practice patterns, you know, as we saw from the poll, as we saw from you know, your talk and uh, 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 Professor uh, Engelter's talk as well. Uh, you know, there's equipoise, which treatment is better. So we're just looking at observational data to see which treatment is better. Uh, and, you know, as you mentioned, dual antiplatelet therapy is probably better than single agent, as we saw from the minor stroke and DIA trials and a lot of these events and dissection. You know, most of them are initially minor events. So, uh, you know, that is probably as safe as aspirin and maybe even better than uh, um, 
you know, aspirin, uh, but on the other hand, it may be uh, as good as uh, oral anticoagulation. So we'll see. We're uh, at 2,500 patients now um, uh, entered, so we're expecting about 5,000 patients. Event rate is about 5%, so we'll see what happens. Be very exciting to get that. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Uh, some question about the risk of using anticoagulation when you have intracranial dissection or, or extension of uh, extracranial to intracranial dissections. If it changed your decision to use anticoagulation. Yes, uh, as I mentioned, I think uh, if there is intracranial extension, I think I would kind of be more reluctant to, to use the the antico, um, the anticoagulation uh, arm and to rather prefer in direction to the to the uh, to, uh, to the antiplatelets. Yeah, that makes that makes a difference, in particular for the virtual wall. I think that probably we do not know yet, but there is some some evidence that the virtual artery, uh, the integral dissection extension of the dissection is more dangerous in the vertebral than in the carotid. Thank you. And we have another two questions, perhaps not directly uh, relation with, with our uh, presentation, but what about uh, chronic pain after dissection? Uh, what do you think is related to the presence of pseudoneurins or, or how do you treat chronic pain after dissection? your experience. Yeah, I can start. Um, so, um, you know, it's not uncommon for patients to continue having neck discomfort uh, or headaches for a while after the dissection. Uh, I always, you know, uh, reassure them that's probably not related to the dissection itself. And, you know, often these patients get follow-up imaging that shows, you know, either stability or improvement of the dissection. Uh, so it's not related to the dissection itself, but more probably related um, either uh, to the neck injury or maybe they have a history of migraine as well, which is a risk factor for dissection. Uh, and, uh, you know, the migraines are worse or the neck injury that caused the dissection um, is causing some musculoskeletal pain. So I would treat it differently. I'd re-image them to make sure the dissection is not worse or they don't have a recurrent dissection. Um, and if that's not the case, then I would just treat them, um, you know, conservatively with, um, you know, either muscle relaxants or pain medications or, you know, just conservative treatment. And in my experience, these patients get better on their own. The dissection heals and the pain slowly gets better uh, over time. Um, you know, very uh, uh, infrequently, it can become chronic. I don't know what others, um, you know, um, um, have to say about this. I think in particular, the last point, I think you, it, I think I have no patients where it, it's still ongoing. It, it takes, it, it can take more than a year or something, but eventually all became uh, pain-free at the end. Therefore, I think to, to explain that, as you as you Shadi nicely uh, summarized that, how it it came to that pain, and uh, and just to to ask for patients that they that they uh, that they should trust that in the end they will become pain free. I think this is kind kind of comforting for the patients, and then to use the usual use of strategies for pain killing. I don't know what the others do. Similar to you guys, I think, for me. Same. Yes. And uh, for resume, there's a, some question about what do you do in your practice, in your daily practice? When do you say antiplatelet and when do you say anticoagulation, but in your daily practice? For all the speakers. Um, yeah. I can start and then, you know, others maybe can weigh in as well. Um, so I prefer dual antiplatelet therapy uh, unless someone has an intraluminal thrombus and the risk of bleeding as well is low. If they don't have a big stroke, they don't have hemorrhagic transformation, uh, I'd prefer any coagulation if they have an intraluminal thrombus or um, the dissected artery is occluded. If they don't have intracranial extension, 
if um, you know, I would prefer um, any coagulation. My practice is to use heparin uh, and then either use a off-label DOAC or or warfarin. Um, but you know, in all the other cases where the vessel is not occluded, it's an isolated dissection with and without ischemia, without an intraluminal thrombus. DAPT is my you know go to uh, treatment. I can go next. I uh, I'm I'm typically a heparin and DOAC person as well. Um, I think I usually use an intraluminal thrombus being one of them, but also like high grade stenosis is another reason to use in my opinion. Um, I sometimes use antiplatelets, but in the past few years, I've, I've more been towards the anticoagulation side. I think importantly, based on a lot of the data that we've also presented here, it seems like the highest rate of stroke is within the first one to two weeks after di um, dissection diagnosis. So in some cases, what I do, although it's a little hard on the outpatient side, is to do one to two weeks of anticoagulation and then switch over to an antiplatelet as well. That's something I've done in a, few, uh, a few times, but I think the majority of the time I practice is to do an anticoagulant over antiplatelet. Yeah, I, as I said, I, I, I would, my route, um, routine is to give dual antiplatelets as, very, as soon as possible, really getting in there in quickly with loading doses. Yeah. And, and for me, if a patient uh, presents just with uh, pure local symptoms without any signs of ischemia and there is no um, occlusion of the artery, I usually do just aspirin uh, as, as an and uh, monotherapy therapy because as you have seen, these are those where there's hardly any risk for, for, for an ischemic event at all. For those presenting with ischemia on the other side, we prefer a, a short time heparin and then switch to VKA uh, as we have a kind of a reimbursement problem and the license problem for the DOACs um, because there's so, so less data for that. And I do not want all my patients to be running into to any kind of legal problems uh, or kind of reimbursement problems. Then uh, maybe that will change for DOAX in, in the long run. We hardly use kind of the uh, DOAX, uh, the dual anticlade so far yet, because either we use the monos for the low risk or the, the, the anticoagulation for the high risks. And they're in the, in the Currently, for us, there is no, no really good rooms. Is there a good reason if if patient refuses and they don't feel comfortable with the with the articulation arm, then we use kind of the dual articulations. So. But it's rare in our center. But maybe Shadi's trial will change everything. <laughs> yes. Well, I think that we are at the end. Uh, we actually answer majority of the of the questions apologize for questions that we couldn't answer during the, the discussion and thank you again for all the speaker for this incredible uh, presentation this incredible webinar I, I think that all we uh, learned a lot about this thank you very much thank you virginia for moderating today thank you to everyone for your time for your presentation for your expertise Thank you to our audience for answering the poll questions and also adding all of their uh, questions in the Q&A. As mentioned already, a recorded version of this webinar will be shared with all of you and uploaded on the World Stroke Academy site. In the meanwhile, you can follow us on Twitter and LinkedIn as well. And our next webinar will take place on March 15th at 5 p.m. CET on the topic of stroke in women. So we look forward to seeing you in our next webinar. And until then, take care. Thank everyone once again. Thank you.